So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the very first UC San Diego Center for Healthy Aging community event titled The Future of Aging. For those of you I haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Danielle Glorioso, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Healthy Aging, as well as the Stein Institute for Research on Aging. Our newly established Center for Healthy Aging focuses on creating a world in which older adults enjoy the highest level of well-being through innovative science, interprofessional collaborations, and community partnerships. One of the ways we are accomplishing this is through the development of a national level think tank. We have assembled a stunning group of multi-professional experts in diverse areas, all with a shared interest in healthy aging. I believe that some of you are aware that this first think tank meeting occurred this weekend. The think tank meeting includes closed doors discussions on healthcare and technology for seniors, and experts from around the country and the world attended to discuss the demographics of aging, the new geriatric healthcare models, and senior centric technologies. We are very grateful that some of these experts have agreed to delay their travel to participate in this community event today. I have to tell you that I am so impressed with the turnout for this event today. What this shows us is that the topic of aging is one that is of great interest to so many of us. And I'm assuming that many of you here today are new to the center and the work that we're doing. So today you'll have a chance to learn more about us, learn about the exciting findings that came out of our Think Tank meeting this weekend, and also hear from leading experts in the field on the future of aging. The work that we do is supported entirely through donations through the community. So I wanna take a moment to thank all of you who have supported us through the years. Please know that your donation is helping us make great strides and advances in creating a more age-friendly society. It is a true honor and privilege to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Dilip Jesty. Dr. Dilip Jesty is the Associate Dean for Healthy Aging and Senior Care and the Director of the Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging and Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosciences here at UCSD. He has published 11 books and over 600 articles in peer-reviewed journals. His main areas of interest include schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders in light life and successful cognitive and emotional aging. He is a member of the National Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences and was the past president of the American Psychiatric Association. He is a recipient of a number of awards and is, and is listed in the Institute of Scientific Information's list of the world's most cited authors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dilip Jesty. So it's really a pleasure to present to you our plans uh, for the work that we will be doing in the new center. So I'm going to talk about the future of aging. So first of all, when I talk about Stein Institute, or the new Center for Healthy Aging, the centers really represent the people who work. And these are my colleagues, they are the faculty members, as well as uh, staff and trainees. So I'm going to begin with what I call the tomorrow land of seniors. The world is changing, and as you will see, the number of older people will be exceeding that of children. Next, I will talk about the evolution of our new center, uh, starting from the Stein Institute, which began 10 years ago. Then, I will present the brand new work of this think tank, which made for the first time two days ago and has been meeting over the weekend. And finally, some take home messages for all of us to go from. So, Starting with the Tomorrowland for seniors, this is an amazing statistic. Over the next 20 years, 10,000 people, 10,000 Americans will turn 65 every single day. Just imagine what a demographic shift that implies. What is interesting is that today, there are about the same number of children who are born every day. However, in 15 years, the number of children born will drop seven folds. So 
it, it will be exactly flipping of the coin that, that until now, that you will see here. This is called the age pyramid. And that reflects the number of people at different ages in millions. So what you see is that the largest number of Americans in 1970 was that of children under five. And progressively, naturally with the expected deaths at every single age group, so it became a triangle, fewer and fewer older people. Look at the age pyramid in 2050. It's going to be almost a rectangle. Except for the last couple of decades, you will see that the number of people over 50 actually will exceed that of number of children under 15. This has not happened in the history of the world. So it's really dramatic shift. And people call it silver tsunami. They say, this is a crisis and a disaster. Medicare and secu social security will bankrupt us. I don't think that's right. I think this is actually a great resource for the country. And I don't think it is silver tsunami. I think it is a golden wave. One thing to keep in mind is that all older people are not same. As we age, we become more different from one another rather than more similar. So what you see is half of the slide that shows the volume of hippocampus on MRI. And the other slide shows the performance on a cognitive test. The point I'm making is that some people in their 80s function or have the type of brain that some people in the 20s have. So the idea that as we get older, the brain and the rest of the body declines progressively is not universally true. People differ, and some older people are doing as well as the younger ones. So the question is, why is it that some do better than others? So the goal here is to turn what may, can be a major crisis into a grand opportunity. As I said, there is going to be this unprecedented demographic shift. And we are not prepared for that. There is not enough number of geriatric trained physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, what have you. So the population is growing older, and yet we are not training enough people to take care of them. So this is a crisis. On the other hand, here we have an opportunity to do something different, do something unique, and start preparing for this new change before the rest of the country does. So how did our new center evolve? Most of you are familiar with the Stein Institute for Research on Aging. This is the oldest institute on aging in the entire University of California campus. It was established in 1983. J.C. Miller, who was a pioneer in the field, he was the founding director. Subsequently, Dennis Carson became the director in 1900, and I became director in 2004. This institute has a three-pronged mission. One is training in aging. Second is community outreach, community education. And the third is research. I will talk about each of these briefly. Since I became director in 2004, we have focused our work on something positive about aging, successful aging. Because there are lots of people working on diseases and disabilities of aging. So we thought it was important to also look at positive aging or successful aging. So in terms of education, we start with high school. We train some of the high school students uh, from the Price School as well as some of the schools in downtown San Diego. Medical students from across the country, we have some NIH grants that pay us for training them. We have research fellowships in successful aging. We give pilot grants to junior faculty. And recently, we began multi-professional special lectures. 
our goal is to break the silos, bring people from different areas, medicine, pharmacy, nursing, social work, name it, and bring them together so we all can put our heads together and find out how we can help the new society of uh, older people. In terms of community outreach, we have monthly public lecture series. Many of you have attended it or have seen these lectures on TV. We also publish a monthly newsletter called Successful Aging uh, that goes to thousands of people in the community. I think a copy of that was included in uh, the handout that you received when you walked in. If you don't receive it, send us an email and then we'll put you on the list for getting um, that electronically. So we have a website, aging.ucsd.edu, and we're really proud. We receive millions and millions of hits from across the world. Um, these are related to our public lectures or the newsletter, or the other activities we are doing. And we have received a lot of local, national, international media coverage for the work on successful aging. And as Daniel said, I really want to thank the community because our work is possible only because of the community support. So just a couple of words about the research we do. And one of the things that we started a few years ago is a study called SAGE, Successful Aging Evaluation Study. This is really a unique study. I mean, there have been many studies of aging across the country and the rest of the world. But our study differs from others in several ways. So we are looking at different domains of aging, physical aging, cognitive aging, psychosocial aging, following the people longitudinally. And we are using a randomly selected community-based sample. We have more than 2,000 people from age 21 to 100. Actually, our oldest person is now 104 years old. Um, we start with a phone interview, then we send them a survey that they complete at home that takes about hour, hour and a half to complete. We also get their saliva sample, and we have extracted the DNA, and we will be looking at the genomic sequencing in these people. And we follow these individuals longitudinally. Our study differs from others in our focus on positive psychosocial traits, resilience, optimism, compassion, wisdom, social engagement. This is not what most of the other studies of aging do. Most other studies of aging focus on dementia, cognitive impairment, depression, and so on. We want to focus on something that is positive about aging. So I want to show you just one slide from our data. So this is the percentage of people in our sample from 20 to 100 who had no physical disability. So if you look at the people in their 20s and 30s, you'll find that most people don't have disability. That's what we would expect. As people get older, the proportion drops. Finally, when you come to around 80, 90s, only a small proportion of people are free of disability. Right? I mean, that's what we would expect. As people get older, they develop physical disabilities. So that's not surprising. Look at what happens to satisfaction with life. It goes exactly in the opposite direction. As people get older, as they get more physically disabled, they seem to be more satisfied with life. Their subjective well-being is better. Their happiness has increased. You know, we talk about fountain of youth in the 20s and 30s. We call it a fountain of misery because there are so many stresses and depression and anxiety, difficulty about deciding whether they are going to go into this field, that field, whom are they going to select as their partners, where are they going to be located, a lot of peer pressure. As people get older, they become more accepting of themselves. But also something improves with Asian. And when I went to medical school, I was told that the brain stops growing after a certain age. And the only thing that happens in old age is all decline. Recent research suggests that's not the case. There is something called neuroplasticity of aging. It suggests that even as we age, our brain 
can continue to grow and develop under the right circumstances. So our studies, as well as those of other investigators, have shown that although there is some degeneration that is inevitable with aging, there are some compensatory changes that occur. Even more exciting is the research showing that new synapses, new blood vessels, and even new neurons in some regions of the brain can develop in older animals if they have physical and psychosocial stimulation. In humans, you can't exactly do those kinds of studies, but there is a lot of evidence now showing that the structure of the brain, not just function, structure of the brain can change with physical, psychological, and social activity. There is also shift in emotional regulation. We become more positive and less negative with age. So the question we asked was, does the wisdom increase with aging? So we started first by looking at what is wisdom. This research is really um, not something that is done at most places. Often it is thought that wisdom is not a real scientific concept. It's a religious philosophical concept. But for the last eight years or so, we have been looking at wisdom in a very systematic, empirical fashion. And I'm really proud that we have published our studies in major journals, including JAMA, about wisdom and the neuroscience. Where in the brain is wisdom located? So what we find is that wisdom does not increase automatically with age, but some components of wisdom seem to increase with age. There is something called grandma hypothesis of wisdom. Data show that when grandparents are involved in bringing up their grandkids, those grandkids live longer, they are happier, and they have more children than the previous generations. This has been shown in mammals, sunfish, and in humans. So as we get older, after say about 45, 50, there is lack of fertility. But we compensate for that by increasing the lifespan, happiness, and possibly fertility in the subsequent generation. So that's a grandma hypothesis. One, one of my favorite examples of wisdom is this miracle on Hudson. How many of you have heard of the miracle on the Hudson? Many of you have. Uh, for those who have not, uh, this is something that happened on January 15, 2009. Uh, US Air Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia Airport of New York. And within moments, a large flock of birds flew into both the engines, and both the engines failed at the same time. This is extremely, extremely rare. Most pilots don't even think about something like that happening. The pilot called, uh, the air traffic control, and they told him that he had exactly three minutes, otherwise the plane would um, crash. And they told him to go to nearest airport in New Jersey. He knew that he couldn't make it in three minutes to New Jersey. Uh, so he decided on his own to land on the Hudson River, and he did that successfully. How old was the pilot? He was 58. 58 is not old usually, but for a pilot, 58 is old. It's close to the retirement age. Would a 28-year-old pilot have been able to do that? No. 38-year-old pilot? No. 48-year-old? Probably no. Because it's not only he made the right decision, but he stayed so emotionally stable. He didn't panic. Nobody else panicked. So he carried out that decision which was different from the, what the air traffic control wanted him to do, and carried it out so successfully. And this is the quote, uh, he, I, I love this quote. He said, it might be that for many years, I have been making small regular deposits in my bank of experience, education, and training. And on that particular day, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. <laughs> if that is not wisdom, I don't know what it is. And this is something that happens with aging in some people, because he had the experience, but he also used it appropriately. So where, 
wherein the brain is wisdom. Um, without going into details, uh, we looked at the literature, uh, and we have been also doing some studies with fMRI and other uh, techniques, and we concluded that there is a neurocircuitry of wisdom that includes something called the prefrontal cortex, which is the newest part of the brain in the evolution, and also amygdala, or limbic striatum, which is the oldest part of the brain. So what wisdom implies is, or involves, is really balance between the newest and the oldest part of the brain. I want to just say a word about also optimism and social engagement. We usually don't think much about that as scientific concepts, and yet there's a large literature, 83 studies on optimism, 148 studies on social engagement. What do they show? They show that optimism and social engagement are associated with better health, more longevity, more happiness, and every which way you look at it, the physiological functioning as well as mental functioning and even longevity increase. The effect of optimism and social engagement equals or, or exceeds that of stopping smoking, treating hypertension, treating obesity, and changing sedentary lifestyle. I mean, if I told you there is a pill that will increase your lifespan and make you happy and make you healthy, you'd be ready to spend any amount of money. But when we say it is so optimism or social engagement, we don't pay much attention to it. But there's a solid literature supporting that. And that's what we want to study here. So this is what we have been doing so far. But recently we realized that actually we need to go beyond what we have been doing. We have been working within the School of Medicine, and that is great. However, when we talk about well-being in older people, it is more than health. It includes several other domains. And medicine, healthcare is not just the medicines prescribed, but involves so many other activities. Technology, uh, lifestyle are becoming increasingly important housing, urban planning, they also will play a critical role. So we established this new center just a few months ago. And our vision is that this will be a tomorrow land in which older adults enjoy the highest level of health and well-being. So we have center with walls, just best here, and center without walls, which will be national and internationally based center. And the think tank that we have put together really represents that um, in a way, center without walls. And so the plan is to really collaborate with uh, colleagues across the country and the world and focus on specific areas like healthcare technology, housing, lifestyle, and environment. Just a few words about the new think tank. So there have been many think tanks, but this think tank is specifically invested in public good seeking to discover and promote ways of making lives better. The focus is, of course, on healthy aging in the emerging society. This is a nonprofit, university-affiliated academic think tank, supported so far by the university and by the community. And again, I can't stress the importance of community support, which we will need um, even to a greater extent as we continue our work and expand the work. So just a few words about each of these areas of focus, healthcare. Obviously, it is important, but right now, the health care for older people is in shambles. It's really, um, it is not cost effective, it is not efficient, it satisfies nobody. Fortunately, there are some exciting new models that are developing. Gary Gottlieb from Harvard, who is actually a member of our think tank, is doing some incredibly innovative work, and he has he and the colleagues are developing new models for treating seniors so that the care is better, they live healthier lives, and also it becomes cost effective. In terms of technology and engineering, actually UC San Diego is really one of the um, most important institutions. Our, the Jacob School of Engineering is the largest school of engineering on the West Coast. Uh, similarly, we have the Qualcomm Institute. Um, 
that when we talk about technology, it includes healthcare-based technology, home-based technology, and social connectivity. And all of these aspects are important. And so this is something we will be looking at in the next few years. Housing. You know, we rarely talk about housing. The old concept of house is that it provided shelter from the elements, from rain, snow, um, wind, etc. The modern homes expect much more than that. And in future, for older people, the home will be a medical center. That is there where they will receive their medical care, partly through telemedicine, partly through other technology, including sensors that they will be wearing. So it's really exciting time for uh, us to look at housing uh, for the older people in this uh, healthcare-based model. Lifestyle. Uh, right now, there are really few guidelines for older people in terms of what kind of exercises they should do, what kind of food they should eat, how much they should eat. There are sort of general guidelines for adults, but not really focusing on older people. Also, they don't take into account the practicality of the suggestions. For example, older, we can recommend that older people should walk uh, one mile every day. Many older people won't be able to do that because they have arthritis, so they have difficulty walking. Then when they leave their home, they're worried about crime. Um, then they may not have company in case they fall down. There is fear of falling. So there are so many things that come in the way. And so we really need to find out how they can actually do what, uh, what is suggested. And lastly, the World Health Organization has something called age-friendly communities, age-friendly cities. Uh, and they have identified 150 cities of this kind only two in the United States, New York and Portland, Oregon. And so the question is, why can San Diego not become an age-friendly city? So they have some criteria, like uh, age-friendly transportation, housing, um, outdoor spaces and buildings, communication information. Also importantly, the respect, social inclusion, civic participation for older people. So, this is something we have begun talking with uh, uh, Aging and Independent Services, which is one of the county agencies, as well as AARP and others in the community. So our next step is for our think tank, we'll have three more meetings in the next 18 months. We will then have a publishable report with recommendations for various stakeholders. We'll also be doing some pilot studies, and for continuing the work, uh, we need, um, obviously, some support from the Community will also be applying for grants and so on. So lastly, the take home messages. So there are strategies for successful aging. Uh, we have been doing the work at Stein Institute. Again, we discussed that at our think tank. Uh, so very important is calorie restriction. Uh, also, there is something called superfoods that are rich in antioxidants. Things um, like green leafy vegetables. Um, vitamin E, curcumin, so on and so forth. Um, physical activity, essential health care, uh, some cognitive activities, social support, social engagement, very important, and attitudes like resilience and optimism. We did a study a few years ago on video exert games in retirement communities. Uh, actually, some of you may have even participated in those studies. Uh, we this was the Nintendo Wii. Uh, so we installed those Wii consoles in the retirement community. Um, what, in the beginning, there was a lot of reluctance. These were people in the 70s, 80s, uh, somewhere in wheelchairs, and they said, oh no, we can't do that. It's for young people. Slowly, after we trained them, they really got interested into that. And they took to either bowling or crumb, tennis, uh, golf, baseball, and at the end we found there's significant improvement in their depression, quality of life, and even cognitive functioning. An example of something that is pretty inexpensive, that can involve lots of people, it's a physical simulation, psychological simulation, cognitive simulation, even social simulation. Uh, so I really feel good that things like that we can do that will help older people in the community. So our basic principles for the center, I'm wrapping up my talk and just a couple of slides. So our basic principles, one, aging is not a disease to be cured, but a process to be enhanced. 
Secondly, older adults are not a burden on the society, but they're a great resource for younger generations. There's a lot of wisdom in that generation. And thirdly, we should focus not only on treating disabilities, but also on enhancing the abilities of older people. We want to keep them healthy for a longer time. So the healthcare costs actually will come down as more uh, and more older people stay active uh, in the community. And as President Kennedy said, if not us, who, and if not now, when? So let me stop on that note. And again, thank you for your attention and thank you for being here.